put it briefly, I when I first arrived in Tibet, it was back in the 1980s, um, there was not much of this degradation going on. There was no dams, there was no, not much mining. So the landscape was fairly pristine at that point. And I always assumed that this landscape, beautiful landscape with uh, high altitude, uh, snow caps, grasslands, lakes, beautiful lakes. I always assumed that it would be there for future generations to see the same as I saw. But that now turns out not to be the case because things are changing rapidly, especially since the arrival of the train to Lhasa. So I thought uh, somebody should point this out. Somebody has to say something about this because it's going to get worse. And uh, if you don't stop what they're doing, uh, what Chinese authorities are doing in Tibet, this landscape's going to disappear. And you say, well, how can a landscape disappear? But the fact is that you can have mining, can have mountaintop removal, you can change a lake, you can drain a lake, even if it's a big lake, you can change the whole ecosystem, you know, within a matter of years, it can change. And we've seen this already in some cases. So that's what got me upset. And um, that's why I started to write about it. Tibetan Plateau is the highest plateau on Earth. Um, all the major rivers are coming from the plateau. Uh, ten major rivers, you'll recognize some of them, the Mekong, Salween, Yalong Sampo, Brahmaputra, uh, the Karnali, the Indus. They're all coming from sourced in Tibet because that's the high ground. And then, so that makes Tibet I mean, a very unusual situation. There's no situation parallel to this anywhere on the planet where it's the provider of, of all of the water for Asia, South Asia. East Asia, Southeast Asia, India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Cambodia, 10 different countries downstream. So that puts it automatically in a bracket of being extremely important because up to over a billion people depend on that water. And up to probably up to 2 billion people depend on that water. That's just the water side of things. Um, if somebody wants to divert that water, like China's planning to do, then that becomes a serious issue for the people downstream. The plan is that they have dammed their own rivers to heck. I mean, they can't dam them anymore, they're saturated. So now they're, the dam builders are moving west. And when they're moving west, they're moving up into the highlands. So they, they're building cascades on dams. So they build the lower cascade on the Mekong, but now they're starting to go higher reaches of the Mekong. They're going up to around Chamdo, which is in Tibet. And the plan is to um, put in mega dams in the higher reaches and, and then link those to a national grid so that they can transport the electricity from those areas into other parts of China where it's mo more needed, like Beijing. Shanghai is where the power demand is, but they're building the dams in Tibet. There's no power demand locally for this. People don't need 500 megawatts of power. The population of Tibet is very small. It's not millions, it's, um, it's, very, it's six million for the whole area. That would fit into half a Chinese city like Chongqing. I mean, you know, it's a ridiculously low population. They don't need the electricity. They don't need the power. So what's needed for is for mining and for energy for factories and so on. So the plan is to hook up a national grid across China, which will take power from Tibet and hook it into places like Chengdu, Chongqing, which Southwest China, which is where this huge industrial base is building up where they have manufacturing bases. So basically they're exporting the power from Tibet. But the other problem, the other thing that's coming up, the other big plan is water diversion from Eastern Tibet towards northeast China and northwest China, where there's a huge demand for water. Northwest China is a desert, the Taklamakan, and there's plans for mining there. For mining, you need large amounts of water. There's already mining going on. There's mining for shale gas, uh, shale oil, tar sands, oil sands, need a lot of water. In the northeast, they need the water for people. There's 300 million people that have very little water, and they've already have two diversions running from the south, from the Yangtze, they're running two diversions already. The third one that's planned is from the, and that'll be the biggest one, is from the Tibetan area. We don't know, nobody seems to know, what, how exactly these plans would come about, but it probably involves a huge amount of tunneling, a huge amount of damming, and a huge amount of diversion. But the facts and figures are not released. So that's just the dams and the diversion. But there's big plans in Tibet for mining, because Tibet is the source of major amounts of copper, lithium, gold, silver, all of which are needed desperately by China's industrial sector, and they're importing it all at the moment, but they could get it from Tibet, they'll get it from Tibet, it's cheaper. Uh, lithium alone would be worth their trouble. The major deposits of lithium in Tibet, which is used, lithium's used for batteries, used for cars now, 
there's be a huge demand for lithium in the future. So where's it going to come from? It could come from Chile, Bolivia. It's going to cost them money, or they can get it from Tibet, much cheaper. I'm from Canada, and um, the major mining uh, people that are involved in Tibet are Canadian mining companies. And not just in Tibet, around the world, in third world countries. So um, there have been a number of, probably a dozen Canadian companies that have been involved in exploration and um, developing mines and bringing in technology, which the Chinese don't have, that's why they need the Canadians, is to bring in the technology, the know-how to, to explore the area. But once they actually get around to mining it, then the Chinese make it very difficult for them and they stonewall on permits and eventually they get bought out by Chinese companies, which is the plan all along, it seems. Unfortunately, these companies, the Canadian companies, don't follow their own ethical um, guidelines when they come to Tibet. They just toss them out the window and there's been movements in Canada to try and get them to abide by their own ethical guidelines, but they don't do it. And there's a case, uh, the biggest company that's involved right now is actually 60% owned by the CCP in Beijing, but it's, under, it's listed under the Canadian Stock Exchange as being listed in Vancouver, Canada. It's called China Gold, the big mine in Guyama, East Tibet. So they're actually Chinese masquerading as Canadian and they're raising money on the, on the Canadian stock markets to exploit Tibet. The nomads have been grazing these grasslands for probably 4,000 years, probably longer. And it's a system that has evolved with the yaks. It's not a natural system. It's, a, a, it's a basically, it's an interaction between the yaks, the grasslands, and the nomads. And what, what happens is they rotate. The, no, the nomads rotate the, the yaks so that they feed off different uh, sections of grassland. So basically, they're taking care of the grasslands for this period of time, and there's been no problems. And, um, you know, if anybody's to blame for, there's a lot of degradation that goes on in the grasslands now. If anybody's to blame, it's the Chinese. They brought in a fencing policy where they fenced off parts of the grasslands and caused a big problem with the nomads fighting over who owns what, because they'd never fought over this before. And then, of course, if you fence an area and you graze it, then you're going to trash the grassland. You, you, the idea is rotation. Rotation keeps it in shape, you know. So what's happened is that they've upset the whole system of the grasslands by introducing these strange policies, such as exterminating the pikas, which are the um, marmots. Um, and this has been going on for 20, 30 years by poisoning them. And these experimental policies like fencing and so on, you can't blame the nomads. The nomads have been, they've had no problems for the last 4,000 years. Um, if you, have, you have to look at both ends of the rivers. So you've got the, the highlands where the source of the rivers is, where the glaciers are. And then you look at the other end, maybe two, 3,000 kilometers away, you get these massive deltas. So you've got the Yangtze River Delta, the Mekong Delta, the Indus Delta, the Brahmaputra Delta. These are, these are the biggest deltas in the world. And many, many people, depending on those deltas for their food source, these are the rice baskets or the bread baskets of Asia. That's where everybody gets their food from. Mekong Delta in Vietnam, for example, is a huge supplier of rice for Vietnam. Well, there's two, there's two forms of transboundary, really. This, um, because China regards Tibet as part of China, they would not regard it as a transboundary river to have the yellow and the Yangtze, but I would regard it as transboundary. So those two rivers come off the eastern side of the Tibet, Tibetan Plateau and go to the east coast of China. That's the yellow and the Yangtze. Both of those rivers have major trouble now. They rarely reach the sea these days. And it's kind of like China shooting itself in the foot because what it does in the upper reaches is going to affect the whole river downstream. So they had a serious problem back in uh, 1997 when they had major flooding on the Yangtze and they sent some scientists, they killed hundreds of thousands, with a huge toll with this flooding. They sent the scientists in to, to check, to find out what was wrong. Scientists came to the conclusion that because of massive deforestation on the eastern side of Tibet, that's what caused the flooding. There was nothing holding back the water in the monsoons. It came surging down and it just flooded. So then, they decided, well, okay, we logged 50% of uh, eastern Tibet, maybe we better stop now. But it was a little bit too late. But then they, they put a moratorium on logging in the highlands, because there's, there's a lot of uh, illegal logging that still goes on. Um, the downstream countries, um, they pretty much have no say in, in what's happening in upstream areas, as China has no water sharing agreements. The impact, especially if you take an example, would be the Mekong. There are five major dams on the Mekong in Yunnan, and that will have a major impact. It has a major impact on the river downstream because the fish cannot migrate 
uh, you don't get the fish hatcheries working the same way. The silt does not come downstream, and the silt is important for, you know, for fertilizing the crops. Silt is very rich in nutrients, and that is blocked, totally blocked by dams. Probably 90 to 95 percent is going to be blocked by dams in a reservoir. That doesn't come in. So if you look at the Indian side of Bangladesh, Bangladesh is heavily dependent on rivers from Tibet. Um, they call it Jamuna, so it's the Brahmaputra is coming out of the Jamuna. Um, they depend on the flooding of that area to get their nutrients, and you know, Bangladesh is heavily dependent on fish, fisheries. So now, for the first time in history, you have a dam appearing on the Yalong Sampo, just finished in November. Uh, the first stage is open. It's called the Jangmu Dam, 510 megawatts. Chinese say, well, this is a small dam, it's not going to have any impact downstream, it's a run of the river. That is not true. It's going to have impact. They can turn the tap on and off. If they want to stop the river, divert the river, all they have to do is turn a switch, and they got control of the tap there, which is the major problem. So that same river also, of course, comes into India, Brahmaputra. And then uh, there's other talk of um, diversion of the Indus and the Sutlej, which would have major impact in northwest India. So uh, what it comes down to is the fact that China is controlling the tap. And whatever they decide to do, the downstream countries are kind of at the mercy of this person who has the tap, which is China. There's not a very good situation with the downstream countries.